sin kills the glory of God. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin kills fellowship between God and man. Ephesians chapter 2 will say that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. When we walked in this way of the world and the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that was working in the sons of disobedience, and we were by nature all children of wrath. Sin has killed the right ordained relationship between God and man. Physical death is not the only death you're getting yourself into. I know it. We get ourselves into trouble. Sickness comes and despair and oh my gosh, what's this going to be? I can't get over this feeling. I can't get over this addiction. I can't get that person to love me. They're going to leave me and break our family. We get ourselves into sin addiction, into depression. We get ourselves into multiple forms of death. Sin is an active soul disease which always, always produces death. Listen, sin's a killer. Sin's a killer that ought to make us truly be alert and run from it like it's worse than Ebola, than it's worse than any other disease, worse than financial ruin. Sin is the thing that is killing the human race. I think that there's a law and you ought to know it. You know stuff about Ebola. Ebola will eat you alive and ruin your organs. I'm telling you, there's a more sure disease and worse disease on the planet. It's called sin. And it will eat you alive and it will destroy everything around you, killing relationships, killing our eternal destiny. As surely as there is gravity, and if I drop my Bible, it's going to the ground every time, because there's gravity, that's a law. So every time that there's sin, it will manifest in this thing called death.
as a young kid, my mom and my dad were both pretty bad drunks. Uh, dad dealt with some uh, addiction problems. Um, dealt with a lot of physical abuse, mostly from the mostly from my mom, to tell you the truth, and uh, uh, mental abuse and emotional abuse from dad's side. And there was sexual abuse from outside of the home, but just uh, darkness always around me, basically. At three or four years old, I remember my dad uh, was wailing on my mom and my sister, who was only seven, had jumped in and tried to help. So she got kind of pieced up a little bit too. And, and I remember that I didn't do anything. And even though I was only three or four years old, what could I have done? I remember thinking that I was weak. It just made me feel really weak. I felt like there's something I should have done. Poor family also, so I know what it's like to be in the wintertime without heat. And that all carried into school life, so the stuff that was going on at home kind of made me a target at school for bullies and, you know, somebody for the kids to pick on, and I just kind of always dealt with that. Inside of me, the things that was going on at school and at home when I was young uh, just made me feel so weak. Even from as young as I can remember, I felt like I needed to be stronger. And it put a big, it just put a big, huge chip on my shoulder that just got bigger over time. As far as home life, I was in the woods all the time. Like that's what I did, I came home. I went to the woods, I came back when it was dark, tried to stay away from my parents as much as possible. After years of, of being pushed around and bullied around and, and dealing with every kind of abuse that you could think of, um, I remember laying on my bed at nights, just fed up, just fed up with being that weak person. I'm not real sure why I got the notion, but I remember laying there and just offering, offering my soul up for the things of this world that I thought I wanted, the things I thought would make it better, which for me as a kid was power, respect, money, women, things like that. I 
went from feeling weakness to just pure rage and just hatred. Just, just blind rage is the best way I can explain it. Something just snapped. Uh, I remember being at school one day when it happened. There was a particular bully that used to just mess with me every day. And this particular day, when he flipped my chair over like he did every day, I just snapped. He went from being bullied and picked on and kicked around to just lashing out at anybody I thought was looking at me wrong. Since I had offered up my soul to the devil at, at around 11 or 12 years old and started to get the things that I had asked for, uh, I figured that was just part of the deal was being doomed to eternal damnation, to not, to not getting into heaven, you know? I really don't know where the idea of offer my soul to the devil even really came from but I know that I know that it was a sincere deal when I did it I mean honestly even at 12 years old I kind of feel like I knew what the cost of it was going to be I kind of feel like I knew even as I was doing it what that was going to mean it just didn't matter to me somewhere over that next year I started drinking a lot of moonshine and and taking acid and, and smoking weed. I was already living in hell to some extent and knew that I was damned to hell when I died. So it was it was kind of just trying to stay numb. But the goal was to not feel anything. Rage kind of started to take over and just, just consumed me. I just felt like I was raged out. I was mad all the time. I just kind of hated the world and everything in it. I went from feeling weakness to just pure rage and just hatred. Just blind rage is the best way I can explain it. I think I just wanted people to hurt like I hurt. I just wanted people to feel how I felt. All I can really remember from that time on is just hatred. I mean, just, just pure hatred and violence and malice and just a controlling mass of force that just never wanted to stop. We can go. Hey, 
that I firmly believe hell burns because of the holiness of God. Children are dying daily in Chicago, Illinois on the streets. They're shooting them down. Murderers day in and day out. Murderers in this town right now would blow your brains out for enough money for a fix it crack cocaine. It's never crossed their murdering mind that they're going to burn in hell. They never thought the fact that they're going to burn one day in hell. I knew there was a God because I knew that I'd sold my soul. Like I, f I really truly felt like I was getting the things that I, that I asked for by being the violent person that I was. And in a way, I kind of felt like I already was in hell. I felt like hell was already on earth. It was just kind of gonna be eternal. So anytime the Lord crossed my mind, I tried to just put it out. Sin's deceitfulness hardens our heart. Sin comes in and deceives us. Sin and deceit are always linked in the scriptures. It, there's, it's always a lie that this will fulfill you more than what God has for you. Sin's deceitfulness comes in and it creates this crust around our heart, this, this impermeable thing. Sin comes in and it clouds the mind. We cannot think clearly. It actually poisons our mind. And so we actually think about the very thing the Lord's doing to help us, we think He's trying to hurt us. The, the very thing that's coming for our deliverance, we think is coming to kill us. Sin clouds the mind. Around 14 is when we moved to Parsons from Virginia. Of course, I carried that rage with me and being in a new place, new school, uh, I was real standoffish. At, if I did talk or anything, it was out of just anger. Uh, most of the time I tried to just stay numb, but I quickly found people to supply me with drugs and whatnot. I used to be drinking and drugging and like, man, I just, I, I don't know, I just fantasized about hurting people. Like, it was sick even to me, even at the time, that it, it was sick to, to think about. But it seemed like the only satisfaction I could bring to it was pain. Take it to the And a lot of times I try to get pain out of it myself. A lot of the fights that I picked, I picked people that I thought were gonna win. They coming back. <laughs> Keep recording. Keep recording, big dog. I got him. You scared or what? Break every man you got. By the time I was 16, I was selling weed. By the time I was 18, I was selling cocaine. Uh, hard off into that. 21, it was methamphetamine, cocaine, mushrooms, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. Uh, 22, 23, I was I'm manufacturing meth. 
That cat drunk. <laughs> that cat got popped. Look at this mother. Even drunker, huh? It seemed like the only time that I thought that I had any peace or happiness was when I was so doped up that I couldn't think about anything. So I was pretty much messed up on something all the time. And if not, well, then I was, I was really violent. So as I got older, it seemed like the seemed like the chip on my shoulder got bigger. It seemed like it seemed like the anger got more intense. Um, it seemed like fighting once or twice a month led to fighting every day. I used to get jumped all the time by sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four guys. And it got to be to where at least once or twice a week, I was fighting two or three guys at a time. So it was actually my enemies that started calling me Psycho Bill. Psycho because I'd fight three or four guys at a time for no reason. And psycho because I didn't, uh, I didn't really care much about life and it just kind of stuck. Uh, and then over the years, you know, I just got, I got to a place to where the things I was doing was to kind of up the name. There wasn't enough violence. There wasn't enough drugs. There wasn't enough of anything to get satisfaction for, for the hate and the rage that was inside of me, for the anger, for the temper that was in me. There wasn't, nothing sufficed. There's times that I would beat my head into the concrete and then I would smash my hands into the asphalt just to try to, to numb myself out. At age 25, my daughter was born. Got a full-time job. I uh, tried to try to quit selling drugs and doing drugs, and it just made me want to be a better person. Made me want to not be the hateful, uh, malicious person that I was. Uh, made me want her to not see me that way. Uh, really, kind of reflected on who I was, it was kind of a big mirror in my face to what I was actually becoming. Hey, you got a soccer ball in your face. Wait and take that shot. You're a little soldier, ain't you? Even her birth uh, made me know that there was a God. Uh, whatever my thoughts or opinions on him or, his, or what I thought he thought about me was irrelevant at the time, I always knew he had a hand on her. I don't even know how to explain that. I just knew that she was gonna be okay. All right, let's hear Burgundy play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Me and her mom split up before she was a year old, and right after that, I kind of spiraled right back in. It seemed like four or five times I tried on my own to clean up my act or whatever you want to call it, and uh, every time I failed, and every time that I failed, it seemed like I jumped back harder and more intense into everything.
when I met Bill Troster, I instantly was drawn to him. And they, they called him Psycho Bill, and he was a tough guy, big guy, and you know he had a lot of respect from people. And and so I, you know, he was older than me, and I actually looked up to him and uh, thought that man, I want to get close to this guy. And we did a lot of stuff together, and we enjoyed you know using drugs together and running the streets and causing chaos and darkness. And so we lived that lifestyle together, and were naturally drawn to each other. And uh, Bill is one of my best friends even to this day. So I met John Smith for the first time about 15 years ago. Uh, we're both two people that uh, use drugs a lot and alcohol a lot to, to mask whatever was going on on the inside. So it was a pretty combustive uh, friendship. So we hung out on a lot of occasions and which usually led to partying, led to fighting, it led to drug dealing, led to hurting people. We were definitely a violent duo. Uh, I was violent all the time. And uh, he was somebody that was kind of down for the cause. Bill was really hard and hardened, and he didn't have or show much emotion ever. And he wasn't afraid of anything, and there wasn't anything that he was afraid to do. And so Bill was a big, mean, nasty guy. He was the guy that you want to have on your side. If you're in a fight, you want Bill Troster there. And so, as a matter of fact, his nickname, if you ask him, Psycho Bill didn't come from anybody but his enemies. His enemies named him that because he was crazy. He would bash his own head on the sidewalk until he was bleeding. and. It was a pretty violent and angry individual. We were both trying to numb out pains on different levels. And when we got around each other, one of the things that masked it beyond the drugs and the alcohol was causing pain to others for some reason. And uh, John was always on board with that. So there was a night where somebody had owed one of us money or, or something like that, I don't really remember. Uh, we had Hazel drive us to the guy's house and I just kicked the door in and we just went in and beat up everybody inside. Uh, it was so much fun to us back then that I think we went to three more houses after that. The last two were just random houses. I've met a lot of people that get happy at the initial intake of sin, but talk to them 10 minutes, an hour, a month after they did that sin. How's it going for them? You ever met somebody that's addicted to substance, that's really happy? You ever met anybody that's addicted to immorality and is manifesting it in their life? And they're just, I mean, having, they're just full of peace and joy and, you know, just smiling all the time. They're not happy. They'll fight for their rights while they're miserable to have their rights to keep on sinning. It's the insanity. It's the insanity. Sin has deceived the planet. Sin deceives the heart where we cannot perceive reality correctly. We cannot see clearly what the next step looks like because we're so deceived, we're so poisoned in our mind. So at the seat of who we are in our heart, our emotions, the very thing that makes up who we are as people, that becomes deceived. It comes in, sin with the deceit comes in and changes the way we think about reality. We actually then desire to do things that we know are going to kill us. I know what the result of this sin is going to be. I can explain it better than anybody can because I've been down this path a hundred times, but I'm still going to do it because it feels good, because I want to. What is that if not deceit and poisoning of the mind? True slavery. It's true slavery. The rage never quit growing. It never, it never stopped. It never quit growing. By the time I was 25, I couldn't even have mirrors in my house. Like I couldn't look at myself in the mirror because evil is all I saw. If there was mirrors in my house, I would just smash them. I was so sick and tired of watching people destroy their lives. I mean, I made a living off of destroying people's lives for 20 years, that's all I did. People that I knew, people that I loved, people that I'd spent years with, I watched them die, I watched them spend their kids' lunch money, I watched, you know, I watched them go from being uh, good, healthy people to being just demolished by the, by the drugs that I was selling, you know, that's not, and that's not counting the physical pain that I was causing people, you know what I mean?
when you begin to embrace that rebellion, that action, and it works within you, it does a work of deception. Now, by the way, I want you to think about it, because this is really my main point today, is getting over the deception about sin, that somehow you can hide it, somehow you can still have a little of it, and still be okay. I don't think that's true. Sin is a deceiver, Romans 7, 11, he'll say, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, it deceived me. It twisted my mind about reality, and through it, then, sin became a killer. I was in this two-man cell in Lebec County by myself, and there was this little 13-inch TV sitting on the in the corner on a stand. And I was like, I want to see what's under this TV because it was making the TV kind of sit at a funny angle. So I lifted it up and I found this free on the inside prison Bible, and on the the cover of it, it's got a guy and he's breaking chains. And so I just sat down on my bunk and I started reading the front. There was a part in the front that talked about forgiveness and hope and a future and how God can change your life and give you a purpose and a plan and just these amazing things. And the next thing I knew, I was on my knees, I had snot coming out of my nose, I had tears coming out of my eyes, and I told the Lord, if you give me another chance to be a husband and a father, I'll give you my life. So I had a peace that surpasses understanding that, that came. I felt the presence of God in that jail cell, and he began a work on the inside. And I like to tell people all the time, Romans 12, 2, where he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Well, in the Greek, the word transform is metamorpho, yeah. and that's where we get in the English language the word metamorphosis. So it's talking about the transition from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So if you would have known me seven years ago, that's what's taking place in my life. I, it's, it's totally, God has worked from the inside out. You know, he, I tell people he's not interested in behavior modification, but a heart transform. Transformation. Yes. He transformed my heart. He yep. gave me a spirit and he's been working on the inside of me. I remember in 2010, uh, getting a letter from John. He was talking about how he had gotten a relationship with the Lord and how great it was. And at the same time, um, he was he was worried that I was going to judge him for being weak or, or soft for it. And maybe thought I was going to quit talking to him. I don't know. I remember thinking, thinking how good I felt for him at the time. Um, I had no judgment towards him about it. I, I didn't write him anymore or anything like that, but not because he had found the Lord, but because I didn't want to discourage him from it. Do 
that do that, do that dance, dance again. <laughs> do the dance. You ain't gonna do the dance again, really? I missed it. Do a dance, Bert. We. What kind of dance is that? We. People that I was working for and with and around had gotten to such an extreme to where uh, my daughter's mom wouldn't let me see her or be in contact with her. Um, I wouldn't go to my best friend's house. Uh, I would anybody that I had love for, I wouldn't be around because they could possibly be in danger of something bad physically happening to them. Or even more than that, uh, I knew that the feds had been building a case for a long time, so there was a possibility that I could get somebody in trouble anywhere I was around. So I couldn't even be around people that I loved. And uh, that was really weighing on me. Just done with life, man. I just, I couldn't see my daughter. I couldn't see anybody I loved. I, I had nothing. Like, you talk about rock bottom, that like there was, there was, there's no basement to, to rock bottom. You know, this was my rock bottom. Like, th this was it. You know, my older teenage years and my early 20s when I thought everything and the drugs and the women and the money was still fun. Uh, even that didn't come with any hope. You know what I mean? Like it was fun in the moment. And then by the time I was 30, you know, it was right back to being 10 years old again. I mean, basically by the time I was 30, all the things that they were fun, the fun was wearing off and it was back to just the reality that, that this is it, that there wasn't, it wasn't gonna get any better. It was, all it's gonna do is get worse. I'd sold my soul. So what that meant to me was that you know, the Lord had damned me already. I'd absolutely thought that there was no chance, no hope of salvation. So as time went on, I kind of despised myself a little bit more and more and more uh, up until the time that I was 33 or 34, which was pretty much the bottom. And that, at that point, I just wanted to die. Physically, I was really bad. Mentally, I was shot. I rode around with a loaded 40 caliber uh, and drugs on me because I figured that'd be my way out. I always looked at suicide as a, a weak man's way out, so I, I would never kill myself, but I figured I'd just wait until they pull me over and shoot it out with the cops and make them do it. So I'm 35 and I'm in, the, I'm in my apartment and I'm thinking about all this. And I, I felt my knees and just, just bawling, and burst into tears, which was really, really uncharacteristic of me. And I cried out to the Lord that He's just gonna have to take the wheel. I can't do it no more. Since I was so sure that I was damned eternally, I didn't think he was going to hear that. So immediately after that, still on my knees, I told him to just end it. Just, just let me get this eternity started because I truly felt like uh, it couldn't be any worse. So I go through that night, it's about two weeks later, 
there's a bunch of people at, at my house. It's like one or two in the morning. I usually didn't go to pick up the drugs that early in the morning because I didn't have a license. And I was just kind of looking around at these seven or eight people. They don't really care about me, you know? I don't really care about them. They're just waiting for me to ante up. So I kind of couldn't take it no more. I felt like I was gonna start fighting everybody. So I jump in the truck and I go to where I pick stuff up at. I walk over to the guy's house and he's outside kind of freaking out. I said that somebody had been out in the alley and he had a bad feelings. So he took all the, all the dope that I was supposed to pick up and he walks a couple blocks away and he has me sitting in the back of his house and just kind of watch. Now you gotta remember, I've got a loaded 40 caliber on me. I've got drugs and paraphernalia and stuff on me. I sit there for about 10 minutes. Man, my gut was going crazy. So I called him up, told him I was gonna go to my truck and get my cigarettes. Whatever it was, had me so freaked out, I took the pistol out of my waist, put it in the truck, I put my wallet in the truck. I took all the drugs out of my pocket, threw them in the truck, shut the door, I'm going back. I, I wanna go back to, to pick these drugs up. I step in a mud puddle. So I literally took my shoes off and threw them in the truck. I'm literally, I've got no shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt. That's all I got on me. I pull the bicycle out of the back of the truck and I'm riding back over there. And as I'm pulling into his alley, I get pulled over for not having a light on my bicycle. And it turned out there was an old driving off suspended they'd been trying to pick me up for for years. And I had to do a flat sentence of eight months. knew, I got new beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it was the Lord that plucked me out of that. The reason it's so significant that I took the stuff off of me before I got on that bicycle is because if I would have had some kind of drugs on me, well then I would have been looking at another 20 years in prison or, or whatever the charges would have been. That's probably the only 10 minute span in 20 years that I didn't at least have some kind of drugs on me. And then to not even have shoes, I couldn't even have ran. If I would have ran off the bicycle, I would have been barefoot. At this point, the big reason I carried the gun was so that if I had a confrontation with the cops, that was my way to die, basically. They were right on the tips of having enough to put me away for my whole life. There was people that wanted to kill me. I wanted to die. If that same cop would have pulled up, and I'd been in my truck, we would have been shooting. I mean, that's how I would have died. There's nobody on the face of the planet that can convince me it was anybody other than the Lord. Even without knowing what it meant to be with Jesus at the time, I knew that. As soon as they gave me my out day, and it was Christmas, like that was just reconfirmation of what I already knew. I spent my birthday in solitary confinement, not even knowing my name, and got released on Jesus' birthday. Uh, wasn't immediate obedient. I went straight back out to the streets. Uh, I bet I went out 24 hours and I was doing a shot of dope and sleeping with an ex-girlfriend of mine. And it was, there was just no joy in it. It was so dull. Everything was so different. So It was so confusing to me. You know, you say you get new eyes when, when you find salvation. None of the old sin held anything for me. The only other thing that I knew was that the Lord was telling me I had to leave that whole area in Southeast Kansas, like, that I had to leave. This is my solo piece from Fair and Dull by Mary Isaac. The part that made it hard was that Burgundy was there and that I had to leave that, but I knew the Lord was telling me that I had to leave. And in some way I knew that I knew that I was going to and I knew that I had to take that step. Without knowing anything else except for the Lord told me that I had to leave, I called the only person that I knew that wasn't in town, which was my sister. And I called her up and she was happy to come get me. I get in the car and I'm a sobbing mess because I'm moving away from any way that I have to make money. All the hustling activities, 
uh, that I have at my disposal are in Southeast Kansas. So I'm leaving without an ID, without any possessions, without any clothes, without any money, without anything, uh, with just this word that I have to leave. And that was my first act of obedience. I was down there less than two days and I get this phone call and it's John Smith on the other end. I hadn't heard from John Smith since 2010 when he sent me a letter talking about how the Lord had intervened in his life and, and how he was living with Jesus. So about six months after I got released from prison, Bill Truster had gotten out of jail. We went and picked Bill up to come hang out for the weekend and kind of knew in that moment that Bill was gonna come live with us. I don't think I was there the full night before he had asked me to come and move into their spare room. First of all, we fixed the camera up at 37 because he's really old, not just old. John bought the wrong number. And then I put over I, 16. I did I it. I don't know who told you that. <laughs> I don't know. Who told you that? This guy over here. You'd think I'd know his age. Bill, would you mind coming up here real quick? Haven't really introduced Bill much over the past six months or nine months or so, but this is my grandson, Bill. His family resemblance is pretty strong. <laughs> and, uh, Bill, uh, what were you doing? What was life like in just a few sentences about a year ago this time? Well, a year ago, I was in jail, so. <laughs> uh, 25 years of drug use, 20 years of dealing drugs and violence. And... So Bill came from a pretty uh, crazy past, and um, John Smith, who many of you know, John and Hazel, took Bill into their house. Got You got radically saved in prison, and when was that that, that you got saved? Well, I actually called out to Christ like two weeks before I got locked up in May of last year. And uh, he was faithful. He took me, out of, took me out of a situation that no way anybody could have taken me out of. So we, we have now the mind of Christ Jesus. And this is, guys, this is why the Bible is so important. This is why I love the Bible. The Bible, it, it, it gets in us and it, and, it, and it doesn't hit our head first, right? It goes into our spirit man first. We read the Bible spiritually and it takes a while. But those spiritual truths start to percolate. Yeah, they start to divide soul and spirit. And I get my thoughts and my attitudes, joints and marrow in my soul, they start to get separated, right? And I start to realize, wow, that's not a God thought. That's a me thought. That hopeless, never gonna work out, I'm never gonna change, that's not from the Lord. What is God's thoughts? Well, I've got it right here. He says, to hope in his unfailing love. I just got a little thought from God. My love for you, Jonathan, never fails. <laughs> well, I could, I could take that one all day long and be transformed by that one thought. When I moved in with John and Hazel, being around the body that they were around, uh, the first thing I noticed is the way people loved each other. And I don't know, I, I felt a love like, I, like I'd never felt before. I think that was the first time that I noticed inwardly that things were changing. And it kind of, I mean, I noticed right off the bat that it had been months since I'd had a violent thought or, or you know, since, since I wanted to, to lose my temper. Your love never fails. Even though I've acted like a jerk, your love never fails me. Even though I just did the thing again and, and I just I failed again, your love never failed, never failed, never failed. And there's this release of hope in our hearts. And that's what he's trying to get to in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because hope will not put us to shame. And when we put our hope in the Lord, it's off of ourselves and things start to fall into place. Bill moved in with us and um, that's when God, I think, really started the, the process of delivering him from slavery and delivering him from darkness and death. Like you see this picture of you like as a kid and you got a, a colored picture in your hand and you got this big cheesy grin on your face and you're handing the picture to somebody and I'm assuming it's the Lord and they take the picture and they're excited about it and they place it on the refrigerator and put a magnet on it and stick it up on the refrigerator. It's like the Lord saying, he's approving of you. Not approving of what you've done, but approving you because you're in Christ. And so where you've met rejection before and you've met disappointment in your past with people and family members or whatever, the Lord's saying he approves of you and that he loves you and that he's well pleased with who you can call. Touching 
<laughs> Actually, the, hey, if it makes you feel better, in the picture you had your little mullet too. <laughs> I got pictures if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> I've watched Bill over the last two years work through some really hard things in his life and uh, watch Jesus uh, work inside of his heart and release him from things that were strongholds and wrong ways of thinking about the world and thinking about himself. And uh, I've been able to see God take a big, mean person that you would say before and turn him into a, a soft lover of Jesus who weeps in God's presence now. go to these people that are lost, Lord, I pray that they see you for who you are and for and for not what the law says they need to be. So God, you rescue the lost, the, the worst of the worst of the worst you save, Lord. If you can save us, you can save anybody, Lord. The first week that I was with John and Hazel and we were praying with Jonathan, just the four of us, uh, man, I just started weeping. I just started crying. And uh, I remember asking John, what's wrong with me? Like. How come every time that I pray about something I'm passionate about, I cry about it? Like, what is wrong with me? And he just looked at me with a big old grin. He says, it's the presence of the Lord. So we jokingly call him Weeping William sometimes because he weeps in the presence of God. And I love it because Bill's the biggest, meanest dude on the planet. You know, you would never want to say that to his face. But the truth is, that's what God's done in his life. That's how God has rescued him and saved him. Just increasingly that compassion that I was feeling that night in prayer, and I think I, I think we were praying for Parsons, as a matter of fact. Uh, that was the first night that I noticed that the Lord was, was changing my heart. I felt like my, my heart had been rock solid for so long, uh, that, and I could feel the Lord was chipping away at that. have a God who can't understand or doesn't feel. If you read your Bible, you'll see Jesus experience a plethora of emotions, a plethora of things, including love, joy, ups and downs, highs and lows, sin. He, he was tempted by sin, sorrow, pain, feebleness, disappointment, rejection by his own people, right? Ultimately crucifixion and death on a cross. I'm telling you, this changes the way you approach God when you realize we have a God who relates. We have a God who knows what we're experiencing and what we're going through. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself was subject to weakness. He didn't give in to weakness, but he experienced it in his body. His body was no different than our body. Jesus had the same body you have, yet without sin. This is why we can say God understands. God knows we don't have somebody up here who is expecting something from us and doesn't understand what it's like to be human. He was human. He's the God man is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. Jesus, the God man.
Yeah, with Bill, as I think it is with most people, is that God has to take us left sometime to get us right, and He has to bring us to the end of ourself. And I think when Bill finally hit the bottom for himself, and he looked up, Jesus was standing there extending His arms, and um, Bill said yes. And I think what's important about Bill's story and his many stories is that Bill stayed in the boat. When things got difficult and things got hard and real personal, Bill continued to say yes, and he continued to stay with Jesus and allow Jesus to work inside of his life and to transform him from the inside out. How do we rule over sin? We love the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus says He is the way and the truth and the life. There's no real comparison between the old man before Christ Jesus and the new man after Christ Jesus. It's like comparing the caterpillar with a butterfly. You really can't look at the two and say they're the same thing. The caterpillar lives on the earth. He's stuck down on the planet. The butterfly can soar in the heavens. He's living on the wind. Even his digestive system is different than he was when he was a caterpillar. Butterflies feed in a different way than caterpillars feed. Their, their desire for food has changed now that they're butterflies. They're glorious to look at. They're beautiful. They're not this little slug crawling on the earth anymore. They're, they've got these huge, gorgeous, ornate wings and their whole life is different. Their, their whole perspective changes. One of my greatest uh, joys and blessings in life is been able to see what God has done for Bill because as far gone as I was, I would have said Bill was even further gone. And so to see God reach in and rescue him and to know him from the past and to know who he was and to see the man of God he's become today has been so life-giving to me. It fills my heart with faith and hope and you know and it just changes my whole perspective on what God can do and how amazing he is. And literally I believe not just me, but Bill is a living and breathing walking miracle. In the kingdom, you only run out of chances when you stop taking them. Infinite chances with God. Not, not, not he's endorsing, go make so many mistakes so I can continue to forgive you. But the answer to your question is yes, he'll take you back and all your brokenness and all your failure and all your mistake, he'll take you back. The only time you'll ever stop running out of chances with him is when you stop taking them. Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is a part of success those very things that we think are gonna crush us and kill us, God makes a stepping stone that we rise above and we learn and then we rise again. That famous verse in Proverbs 24, 16, for the righteous falls seven times, but he rises again. I think the biggest thing is he's delivered me from, from that hatred, that malice, that, that darkness, that wicked, that evil rage that, that had built for 35 years, that it was out of control, that hated everything, especially me, the Lord had taken that away and given me a heart of compassion towards other people. What used to be hate and ill will has been turned into uh, to love and, and to mercy and to, and to want to see other people feel the love of Jesus. Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, by the, by the remaking of your thinking, uh, the rebirth of your mind. So sin stains our brain to think incorrectly about God, about ourselves, about people around us. It, it stains our brain to think incorrectly about the, the types of pleasures that we want to pursue and what the highest goals of life are. So the process of transformation, Romans 12, 2, again says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds, the rebirth of your minds. So transformation happens mentally. It happens in the pathways of our thinking. Our minds get turned upside down from wrong ways of thinking to right ways of thinking. The, the Word of God turns my thinking upside down to think like God thinks. 
to, to think humbly, to, to think at a higher level than I've ever thought of before. A tomb is the perfect place for the birthing of a resurrection life, a resurrection testimony. He can redeem your worst stuff. He doesn't endorse your worst stuff, but he can take your worst stuff and make it a platform for you to display his glory. Jesus takes this rageaholic, this psychopathic, this wicked person, this wicked evil person that wants to hurt and demolish everything around him, and wants to die and ask for death, and reaches out and saves me from that. And now, instead of hate and rage and anger, has given me a heart of love and compassion. Instead of not being able to see my daughter uh, because of my choices, uh, I can actually talk to her about Jesus now and spend time with her. So I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would reveal yourself to her. Uh, I pray that uh, you would give her that one-on-one -on -one encounter that only you can do. Yes. I pray that she truly know the, the meaning of uh, not conforming to the world. I pray that uh, I pray that she never tries to just live up to what people think she needs to be or the world says she needs to be. I just love her. I just love her for the unique person that she is, Lord. So I just pray, Lord, that uh, she would always know that. I pray she'd know that on a on a just a very deep level, just the light that she is. I mean, besides being redeemed, I can't think of a better outcome of being saved than to be a positive influence to her now. Like it just breaks my heart to know uh, how negative of a person I was then and uh, to, to have glorified the things that I did then. But to know that, that I can talk to her now about Jesus and pray in front of her and show her that there's hope and that there's salvation uh, that's just a, one of the biggest blessings I can think of. No one has sinned yourself out of the reach of the grace of God. Where sin increases, what happens? Grace increases all the more. I promise you. You think your heart's gone so cold and you've been so far and everybody around you is advancing and you're the only one. Oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. I tell you, you're just being lied to by the devil. We have this omnipresent, omniscient God who's everywhere, knows everything all the time. And he's actually walking in the midst of the darkest of the dark situations with you and with me, with people who are doing the worst of the worst things. God's right there with them in that moment, ready to answer their prayer for salvation, to, to, to rescue them out of darkness and, and bring them into the light. Uh, he takes great pleasure in saving the worst of the worst so that he shows how deep his love goes and the power of the gospel. Um, it, it, if it took the power of God to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. That same power is what he exerted to raise you and me from the dead. He, he rose us up from the ashes by his great power, and he can do that with anybody. There's no one who's gone too far that cannot be saved. Hebrews chapter 7, 25, what a great verse. It says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus' salvation is an uttermost salvation. Jesus' salvation is full. The good news is this morning is that your sins can be paid for 
but you also can be done with your sin. God is not looking for you to get more resolved, get more serious about God and quit sinning. It's just not gonna work, I'm telling you. I'm 48 years into this gig in this body, that doesn't work. The only thing that works is receiving Jesus as your victory. Jesus is the only place of liberation over sin. He's the only place. I know I felt like I was beyond hope. I was out of reach. I had sold my soul to the devil at 13 and done the devil's bidding. So I, I couldn't have that salvation from the Lord. And knowing that, knowing that he loves me enough that he would give me salvation, not only lets me know that, that people that have done what I've done or less absolutely can get that salvation, but it gives me the hope and assures me that, that even people that have done way worse than that can also be saved. There's no depth of the pit that Jesus can't reach. He's defeated, he's defeated all of it.